you so much for taking time to join us today. Um, my name is Bevan Baker. I'm joined here by uh, Tim Cholko. I'm a financial advisor with Fort Pitt Capital Group. And Tim is a member of the Orchid Society of Western Pennsylvania and also has Harbinger Orchid. So a little bit about me. Uh, as I mentioned, I work here with uh, individuals at Fort Pitt Capital Group. I also work with a lot of business owners. I work with people in transition, women investors, uh, and those in the emerging wealth space. It's important um, to help people throughout the different phases of their lives um, and to help our clients and their family members as well. Uh, when I'm not at work, you can find me involved uh, with volunteering and local theater organizations. I really enjoy outdoor activities, and I am also a member of the Orchid Society of Western Pennsylvania, uh, which we'll talk a bit more about later. Um, Tim, anything you want to say about yourself to get us started? I've been a member of the uh, Orchid Society of Western Pennsylvania for 40 years. Um, <laughs> I'm also avid gardener, uh, any kind of plant I can be obsessed with. I'm obsessed with uh, corpse flowers, which they don't all stink. Uh, <laughs> there are some that actually smell good, and there are some that do well on a uh, windowsill. Uh, pretty much just a well-rounded garden geek, nature geek, pretty much just a geek. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. So a little bit about Fort Pitt Capital Group. Um, we offer in-house investment decisions. That means we're not outsourcing any of that. Um, it allows us to bring a higher level of advice to our clients. Uh, we, area. Um, we work with clients to have a small dedicated advisory feel um, and we really focus on having a personal approach. Uh, so we work with financial planning, wealth management, and we also work with businesses uh, from a consultative standpoint and uh, with employer-sponsored retirement plans. We really believe in a holistic approach. And I think that's something that you're gonna hear as a theme um, towards what I do and how I work with clients as well as the other advisors here and a bit about what Tim's gonna talk about uh, with orchids and how the whole ecosystem uh, really makes a difference uh, when it comes to success. We also believe in transparency. Uh, we want our clients to um, understand and be clear with uh, what actions we're taking and why we're doing that and then adapt that with time. So a little bit about our webinars. Um, we do more than just offer financial advice. We really want to offer advice when it comes to clients' lives. Um, we're not um, masters of everything, so we uh, bring subject matter experts like Tim in to partner with us. Um, we really want to tackle questions that have to do with life. Um, we also in other experts like lawyers, um, CPAs, healthcare professionals, people talking about Medicaid and Medicare, etc. We know that life can be really complicated to navigate, so we want to either provide that advice to our clients or um, bring in a panel of experts to help them um, with the most holistic approach. So, how to interact with us. Um, if you're on a device, you can tap your screen um, to ask questions and then to get handouts. Um, on a computer, uh, here's uh, some information about where the handouts are, and then you can also type questions in. Um, there's gonna be some time at the end, we'll be able to take some questions, so we really encourage this to be as interactive as possible. Also, um, you can, um, on the desktop, uh, click at that arrow for desktop questions and handouts, just depending on how you're accessing the webinar today. All right, so Orchids 101, Moth Orchid Culture, or Phalaenopsis Orchids. Um, so my part, part one, is beautifying your retirement. Um, so when we talk with clients a lot, it's about what their retirement's gonna look like, what their spending's gonna look like, it's also really important to think about leisure. Um, you've worked so hard, so how can you enjoy your retirement and also um, not let that derail your budget? So agenda, we're gonna talk a bit about preparing for your retirement, the different phases of retirement, um, what that looks like, where your money is gonna come from, a, a very important question to ask. Um, hobbies, why are they so important and how are you gonna fit that into your overall plan? And then, fun part, executing your vision. 
So one thing that people ask us a lot is how much money am I going to need? Am I saving enough? Am I on the right track? Uh, general rule of thumb, save 10% into your retirement account during your working years. Uh, you may need to adjust that for different you know, points of time, depending on um, how much your spending looks like, what discretionary is, but that's a usual you know, baseline to start at. Uh, when you're thinking about retiring, Generally speaking, having about 10 to 12% of your salary in your retirement accounts before you retire will give you enough cushion. Uh, another popular rule is the 50-30-20. Um, so 50% on needs, 30% on wants, 20% into savings. Now, you may be saying, Bevan, you just told me 10% into my retirement account. Your retirement account is an important way to get you to retirement. Having different buckets um, to pull from is really helpful. So that might be an emergency savings. That may be um, an investment account that's outside of retirement. These are just going to give you more options in retirement. And also if things like legacy planning, um, passing money along to charitable organizations, to family, um, it's just going to give you more options if you have different types of tax treatment within that as well. Uh, when you're looking at your retirement account and trying to figure out how much money could I pull from this to help to you know, supplement my income um, you know, after my working years, usually looking at 4% of a, of a withdrawal rule annually um, is going to uh, lead most often to success. So again, you've got that important cushion there. So different phases of retirement. Uh, we talk a lot about retirement, but it does not look exactly the same depending on where you are and kind of how life has, has followed you up to that point. Um, so pre-retirement, really important, starting about age 50. Um, you want to see, are you on track? Is there um, a gap that you have to make up? Um, what age do you plan on retiring? Um, and how does that fit into your career goals, your family goals, etc.? Um, and is there, you know, other things that you need to do? Maybe considering how much it is that you're saving. Um, are you doing Roth? Are you doing pre-tax, etc.? cetera? Um, all things that are important um, to consider. Um, early retirement. This is our big transition time. This is the time of, of the most change. It's exciting. It can also be a little bit scary. Um, so you need to plan to manage your income now. Um, you're probably on a fixed income. Being aware of big expenses, are you going to be relocating? Um, are you downsizing? Uh, are you going to be making a big purchase? You know, we have clients that may say, I wanna travel, I'm gonna get a motor home, et cetera. Um, but overall planning for changes in cost of living is important. Um, the other thing is that, you know, asking questions around now, um, are you paying off a mortgage? Are you funding other family members on college expenses? Are you planning a lot of travel? All things to think about pre-retirement, but then in that early retirement phase as well. So middle retirement, which is 70 to 80. Uh, by now, you should be receiving Social Security. Um, the reason I say should be is that you max out at age 70. If you wait beyond that, you're not getting any more money. So if you're 70, take your, take your Social Security. Um, required minimum distributions. So from your um, tax-deferred retirement accounts, you're um, going to have to start taking money from those. So that's something to plan um, and also what the tax implications of that are going to be. Wills and estate plans, right? Um, you know, I know that I redid my will earlier this year, um, not because I'm planning on using it anytime soon, but I just want that to be a worry that's taken off the table. And I want to control that now in terms of how my affairs are going to be settled. Um, finding other ways to save as well. Um, as our lives change throughout retirement, some of the activities that we're doing earlier on might change. And we might pick up more interests along the way as well, uh, perhaps where kids are gardening. Yeah. Exactly. Then late retirement. So um, that's the phase where, you know, we, we might have started to slow down. Um, our interests, our energy levels uh, may change and healthcare costs are something we have to think about as well. So um, reassessing retirement savings, reassessing our spending, as well as our investment allocations is something that's uh, 
good to do throughout, but um, especially, you know, an, an additional check at that point. So where's our money going to come from, right? We've worked for so long. Now we're trying to figure out, I'm not going to have a paycheck. My retirement account's going to be sending me money as opposed to vice versa. Um, the biggest chunk here that you can see is from our employer-sponsored retirement plans. Or you don't have an employer-sponsored plan, maybe when you start on your own, like an individual retirement account. Um, that's the part that we can control. Um, something that I've noticed over the almost 20 years you know, since I've been in the finance industry, pensions are not nearly as prevalent and we continue to see that change. Um, so you can actually see that the smallest portion of this is the company funded pension plan. Um, some people still work in retirement. Maybe it's because they need to, maybe it's because they want to. Um, I know people that do that because they get a great discount or it helps them get out of the house and help to socialize and interact with people. Um, social security is a factor. We don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, but it is likely in my opinion that there's gonna be something there, um, but we can use that as, as a supplement as opposed to the crux of where that money's gonna come from. Other savings and investments, that other bucket that we talked about, that other 10% of savings I mentioned earlier, um, and then other, maybe it's money that we stocked away from different places, maybe it's investment properties that we own, um, but it's, it's helpful, I think, to see that there's a lot of different pieces of that pie. So our spending changes, and we talked a bit about that earlier. Um, interestingly enough, uh, our highest point in spending is midlife, that 45 to 49. That's also for a lot of us when we have the least amount of time. Uh, we may be taking care of kids, we may be taking care of parents, we're mid-career, right? It's go, go, go. Um, and we know that we often trade time for money and vice versa. Um, but then we can see that change over time as well. Um, and this doesn't look the same for everyone, right? So a lot of assumptions in retirement think that the kids are off the payroll, you don't have a mortgage, um, you don't have other expenses left over from your working days, but that's different for everyone. So I think it's good to look at what this um, may uh, appear to be for you, but then really drilling down to be more specific for your situation. So hobbies and retirement, why are they so important? So time affluence, the one thing <laughs> that money cannot buy uh, well, other than happiness and love. There's actually wow. a few important things, but time is definitely one of them. And in a culture where we tend to work and work a lot, I know I spend more hours with my colleagues than I do really with anything else. And that's the same for a lot of us. Um, so it, it's exciting you know, to have this gift of time in our lives. Um, However, our jobs give us a big sense of purpose. So it's important to have that um, in retirement and also to know what that's gonna look like. So hobbies make us feel more productive. They make us feel connected to people and they're better for our health. Um, studies have actually shown that they're better for our cognitive health and they can actually ward off um, cardiovascular issues like strokes, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's something that's really important for ourselves holistically. Um, they also can give us a sense of identity after those working years as well, and a feeling of calm, which, I mean, who, who doesn't want to want a feeling of calm? So, talked about hobbies. How are we going to pay for them? Really important question. Knowing your retirement budget is very important. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Being on a fixed income means that you really have to know your budget well, and also plan for unexpected expenses, right? A car breaks down, um, a roof leaks, a pet gets sick, you get sick, we just don't know. So, um, you know, plan for some unexpected expenses in there. And if you're uh, watching this webinar right now and you're thinking, I have no idea how much money I'm gonna need in retirement, that's however many years off. General rule of thumb is to plan to spend about 70 to 80% retirement of what you were earning pre-retirement. Now, again, that's assuming um, certain expenses that you no longer have, so you can tweak that, but if you're not sure, great jumping off point. So budget deep dive. Really understand where your money is coming from, 
um, the sources of money and understand the implication of taxes. Um, one of the things I talked about earlier was, you know, uh, are there going to be changes in retirement? Are you going to relocate different states, tax retirement different ways? It's important to have a good understanding of that. If you're not sure, working with experts um, like a certified um, a CPA or a financial planner can really help with that. Um, try to price out your necessities. Those are your rocks. Uh, the hobbies are the pebbles that fit in around that. Um, try to anticipate what you're going to spend on leisure activities. Um, and again, prepare for the unexpected. That's one thing we can always count on. So how much are your hobbies going to cost and how much of your budget can you afford to spend on them? Think about your fixed costs. So uh, if we're thinking about orchids, right? So we can think about the plant itself, the supplies, humidity, lighting, things of that nature. Are there going to be reoccurring fees like um, memberships or um, if you're an exotic orchid collector, are you traveling to a rainforest once a year to bring some back? Um, and again, building in a cushion. So uh, it's important to build some hobbies into your budget, but again, prioritizing the essentials. So leisure activities. There's a big range. We're going to talk about the cost of some of them. So more of our high end. A motorhome, something I mentioned earlier. About $160,000 um, as far as an Alaskan cruise. This is going to be a really nice cruise, but a little bit over $16,000. Golf course golf course memberships, not including initiation fees. Again, something important to budget for. Uh, theme park, I don't know if anyone's gone to Disney recently, it continues to get more expensive, um, but if you're going, you're bringing kids, you're bringing grandkids, um, it's, you know, if you're looking at spending a few thousand dollars on that. Orchestra subscription, right? You want some nights out, um, parking, dinner, et cetera. Again, probably a few thousand dollars a year and cooking lessons. So this is top of the line. Um, you're going to be entertaining. You're going to um, impress all of your friends, but you know there's a price tag that comes along with that as well. Other examples of leisure activities. There's a broad spectrum here. Um, a lot of people take classes. I know when my mom retired, she started taking Tai Chi classes. Um, people awesome. craft. Um, there's walking, hiking, cycling, golfing, fishing is a big one, um, woodworking. Uh, again, so we're seeing things that are active, things that are social, and then things that where you have something tangible at the end of it as well. There's a lot of things that you can do that are much less expensive as well. Um, gardening. Uh, again, something that's not going to cost you nearly as much. It can, there's you, could, a, you could spend a lot of money. You could spend a lot plants. of money. <laughs> you, you very much could. Um, you can also, you know, join a Facebook group for people that are propagating plants and get some free hostas exactly. for someone that's split. So uh, a, a lot of variance there. Um, book clubs are great. Um, some people do podcasting. Some people do birding. I, I got into birding. Birding is awesome. It is. You get, you get to travel with that stuff as well. Um, volunteering, something a lot of people like, that time affluence, and you're giving back. It's something I, I really enjoy. Pretty much gas is the only expense. Very true. Gas and time. We've got our time affluence. So making room for your priorities. So there's choices that we have to make all the time, especially when we're on a fixed income, and especially during periods of really high inflation, like we've seen over the last two years. It, it's come down, um, but it's still not really where we'd like to see that long term. Uh, so think about what's really important to you and figure out where you can make compromises and don't be afraid to reassess and adjust. Um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can get a very rare hybrid orchid that you have to keep in very specific lighting, yeah. very specific humidity. Um, some of the things we're going to talk about today is there's an entry level to a lot of these things uh, as well. So don't think of it as black or white. There's a big spectrum, a lot of gray in there. So one of the things that I really love, especially as a financial advisor, is having a plan. This is going to help you to feel grounded. It's going to be something that you can refer back to during times of market volatility, 
um, you know, uncertainty in your life, etc. So think about travel, something a lot of us want to do to visit friends, to visit family. Um, maybe it's to get an experience or something that we can't get, um, you know, in our hometown. Consider other types of fun. So there's golfing, there's the symphony, there's the orchestra. There's also doing really neat things like volunteering and maybe you decide to get a subscription to one place and be an usher somewhere else and you can get to see some of those shows as well. Most importantly, be flexible. A good friend of mine said to me a long time ago, rigid things break, be flexible. Um, and that's an important lesson to carry with us. In summary, know the value of planning ahead. There is um, nothing that can replace um, some forethought and uh, you know, some anticipation of what that's gonna look like. Have a good idea of what your finances are and reassess those over time. Hobbies are really important. Uh, and one of the other things too is start to get into some of those hobbies before retirement. They can help people feel less lost. Um, different places to do that. You can look at Facebook groups, you can look at community centers. Um, you know, social media has given us a really wonderful way to make the world a lot smaller. Um, reassess throughout time. Um, get a professional outsource. Uh, I don't repot my own orchids. I take <laughs> them to the orchid show because they're going to do it a whole lot better. So um, have attorneys, have financial advisors, have accountants that can help you with different aspects of this. Um, you may find that it's just not the best use of your time or your talents. Um, and enjoy. You worked really hard to get there. So give yourself some time um, to, you know, really embrace a new phase of life. And with that, Tim, turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, just <clears throat> talking about some hobbies. Again, I said earlier, I've been growing orchids for 40 years um, and pretty much every other kind of plant you know, known to man. Uh, but it's, it's kind of important not just to have one hobby, but have multiple hobbies sometimes because as I got older, certain hobbies kind of dropped off. You know, let's face it, you know, some hobbies get a little bit more expensive. In the case of growing orchids, they've actually gone the other way. We have mm. the beautiful Phalaenopsis that you see in the big box stores. They've actually dropped in price. Uh, the, the same Phalaenopsis that you can buy in a big box store for now between, we'll, we'll say 15 and $20. Um, you know, 40 years ago when I started were 40, $50. And, mm -hmm. you know, imagine what inflation, how much that would cost today, be what, yeah. 60, 70, whatever. Um, but it's important to have multiple my mother and I did a lot of traveling after she retired, so that was a great thing too. My mother really had a bad experience traveling with a friend and really didn't have much trust after that. And we became travel buddies. So I got to see a lot of things. We did cruises primarily. So you get to get a little tidbits of things here and there. Uh, so it's kind of important to have multiple hobbies. So, mm -hmm. um, so getting right into the Phalaenopsis, um, Couple some uh, local resources, and you can print this out, correct? Yeah, they, they have the ability absolutely. to print this out. They'll get so, a copy. Orchid mm -hmm. Society, OSWP.org. Uh, we have monthly meetings. In, oh. It is the third Sunday. Well, I knew that, but uh, oh. the, the, the area. Hazelwood. 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 Couldn't we be just good. moved. Yeah, we just moved. <laughs> we moved to Hazelwood. It's a beautiful space, decent parking, uh, big open uh, meeting space. Um, talking about social media, we have the o o Orchid Society of Western Pennsylvania page, and that gives you updates on uh, times of meetings, uh, the show, which is in the third weekend of March, mm -hmm. and uh, also they post uh, members' photographs. Another Facebook page, and there's Orcaholics Anonymous. Uh, this is our local group. And it's it's primarily local group, but we do have people from outside of the era, area. There's spelled O R C H I is the local group. There's also R O R C H O. Now that's a nationwide, actually it's a worldwide that has I think about 14,000 members. So if you want, if you don't want to have a panic attack with you know 14,000 members, go with the local group. But both groups are fantastic. I'm a member of both of them, and I'm a moderator in both of them. So we can. Uh, just some basic facts about orchids. Uh, a lot of people have a tendency to ask me what makes an orchid an orchid, blah, 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 blah. But anyhow, 
uh, when we look at most orchids that you see in the big box stores, or actually even most uh, garden centers, and even a lot of the vendors that you're going to see at the show, the majority of them are, are hybrids. And right now, there's over 100,000. When we look at the Phalaenopsis, the big box store orchids, the moth orchids, um, the majority of those stem from only three to seven species. So out of, you know, a genus of 70 to 75. Um, they're incredibly old generation wise. They are at this point 25, even some are even 30 generations away from the species. And when you look at the photographs at the bottom of the page, uh, you know, decades ago, you could only find the big whites or pinks or some spotted, and these are the species that these come from. So, oops, what did I do? Uh, I don't know. There. Oh, no, it still didn't do it. Okay, there we go. There we go. So, <laughs> what is an orchid? A lot of people ask me what makes an orchid different from other flowers. Um, some of this I'm going to skip through. Uh, for time considerations, but we believe that they evolved, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, or 100 million uh, years ago. Um, when we look at a flower of an orchid, uh, two words that come to mind is reduction and fusion. And basically, when we look at the male naughty bits and the female naughty bits have been fused, and then there's been modifications to the petals and the sepals. Orchid pollen also has uh, been modified. Instead of being the powdery uh, pollen that you see. If you go to Phipps during the Easter show or the spring mm -hmm. show, whatever, mm -hmm. you, you, you stick your nose in one of them, you come away with the orange stuff. You're not gonna have that with, with the orchids because they've actually been uh, modified. Uh, and then when you look at the lip, that modified structure that's usually at the bottom of the flower, that's a modified petal. And looking at here, this is a, just a daylily, which again is another one of my obsessions. Imagine <laughs> that. But daylily, you have three sepals, three petals. In the orchid, you have three sepals, two petals side by side, and that lip at the very bottom we call the labellum, that's a modified petal. So it looks completely different than the, the, the petals. And then the very center, which actually looks like a bird's head, with two eyes, that is what's left of all those stamens and the stigmas. They've actually fused together. And in the next uh, slide, um, you can see it from the side that it is actually fused together and uh, just a different phalaenopsis. Um, and this is what the pollen has turned into. Um, instead of being powdery pollen, they're actually in uh, clumps. Uh, we call them pollinia, and some of them are very solid, almost like a tomato seed, and others of them are, are more uh, open and uh, smushy. Um, I'm, we're going to skip through this. We'll have yeah. uh, at the uh, very end. So some cultural suggestions, uh, just getting into how these things grow. Now, there are many different kinds of orchids that you can buy in the big box stores now, mm -hmm. as well as at the orchid shows or from online vendors. It's imperative that you know what orchid you have. Um, we have Phalaenopsis, which are the big box stores, orchids again, we're now seeing things called cattleyas, which were the big honking uh, corsage type orchids. Yeah. And we, some smaller hybrids that are, are easy enough to grow on a windowsill, dendrobiums, oncidiums, paps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when we look at light exposure, these various groups have different light requirements. Um, when you look at a lady slipper, Pathia pedalum or Phalaenopsis, <coughs> excuse me, they prefer filtered indirect light, whereas some of these other groups need significantly more light to bloom and to do well. Uh, Dendrobiums can take almost, some of them can take almost full sunlight, uh, but a Phalaenopsis would burn under the same conditions. Mm -hmm. I've made that mistake before. Well, we all have. <laughs> we all have. Um, now, when we look at windowsills, if you're going to grow on a windowsill, some of this is really common sense, but I I'm still going to touch upon it. Uh, if you're on a windowsill, be aware if there are trees nearby that obstruct the light. Uh, the sun, uh, another thing that a lot of people don't realize, that it's only uh, come to my mind within the last 10, 15 years, is the sun is higher in the sky during the summer than it is in the winter. So uh, we'll, we'll see this in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it's lower in the winter. There are light meter apps that I suggest. You download these on your phone. They're free. Um, you might actually have to watch an advertisement when you open it up, but it's free. 
Um, and these two are the two best that I found. Now, if you don't want to do the apps, we do what's called a shadow test. And that is not my hand. Uh, my <laughs> hand is significantly younger looking than that. But when you look at the Phalaenopsis, you're not actually looking at the bright part, you're looking at the shadow. Um, upper left, very bright light because it's a very distinct shadow. Lower left, excuse me, lower right. I have no mm -hmm. sense of left and right, sorry. Okay. Lower right, that is what you're looking for. You're looking for that very diffuse uh, shadowing on the tops of the plant. They could go, uh, Phalaenopsis could take uh, to the lower left, lower left as well, but they prefer the lower shadier. Uh, now this is my windowsill and usually if, if this was in person, I would do the Macarena and whatnot in front of the screen to do, <laughs> make it easier for you. But I live in a valley. So uh, in the deep winter, if you hold your hand up straight out and hold it up about up, that's approximately where the sun comes up in the winter time. Now, if you hold your hand out approximately, we'll say 2.30, 2 o'clock, 2.30, that's approximately where the sun comes down in wintertime. But it's low enough that it arches up over the house beside me. So this windowsill in winter gets almost full sun from uh, with sunrise to sunset. Now, as the sun gets higher, towards summer, now you have to kind of contort yourself. Basically, you're now holding your left hand at approximately seven or seven o'clock. That's where it comes up and it arches up over the house and then it comes down approximately four o'clock. So this window gets zero direct sunlight in, in the summertime. Mm. And that is a progression uh, between there that eventually around August, um, this starts getting some direct light uh, for the winter. And then approximately April or May, uh, as we're getting closer into summer, it stops getting it. So you get some light between about August and April in this window. So that's kind of an important thing that uh, you may have to move plants around during the year. I'm going to skip that. Now watering. Um, I discussed earlier with uh, a person here who has a, an orchid in the office. Um, the plant was dehydrated. They thought it looked terrible. It's, it's salvage, also repotted. But anyhow, um, <laughs> again, depending on your orchid type, it's going to your watering regime is going to depend on the type of orchid. When we talk about a Phalaenopsis, we they prefer to be what we call evenly moist. And I know the M word for some people is a trigger, but anyhow, I've been saying evenly moist for 40 years, but evenly moist. Um, some drying is tolerated. This does not equate to being wet though. Um, and then we have other orchids, Cattleyas, Dendrobiums, and Oncidiums. They need to dry out in between because otherwise their roots will rot. Uh, Phragmopediums is a type of South American lady slipper. They can actually be grown in a saucer of water. So just, in, you know, mixed collections are tend to be easy to deal with. Um, orchids should be watered and not with ice cubes. I have run into two people at in the last 10 or 15 years of doing talks that have told me that they've been doing bang up jobs with ice cubes. Um, if you're doing bang up job with ice cubes, I always say, don't if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> um, but for the most part, you take your plant put it in your kitchen sink or in a sink, and you let water run down through it. You can get water on the leaves. Uh, what I tend to do is, in the if you have a handful of orchids, get up in the morning, put your orchids in, give them a good soaking, let them water, the water run down through, warm water, and then go about your breakfast, your morning routine and whatnot, your showering. And then by the time you're ready to go to work or leave the house, they can go back into the window. Um, larger collections, several trips and whatnot, but uh, it's best to water them well as opposed to just a pittance from a few ice cubes. Now fertilizing, you're, you're novices, this is a hobby, you're not some crazy lunatic orchid grower like me who had, you know, at one point I had all these specialty fertilizers, you know, fertilizer for each tip, different type. Um, they're not big feeders, they are uh, 
you could use the blue stuff, mm -hmm. the Peters, the Miracle Grow, but you want what's called a balanced fertilizer. Uh, the number is going to be 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 20, 30, 30, 30. However, if you do go to one of the orchid shows, you can get these little containers uh, of specialty orchid only fertilizers. If you have an opportunity to do that, that's a good idea. But the other stuff will work just as well. And then how do you do it? Uh, you're going to be watering your orchid once a week. How do you fertilize? Now, if you're a crazy lunatic orchid person, um, you could do what we call weekly, weekly, which basically you're going to water your orchid and then you're going to have your mixed up orchid solution made already. When they're done uh, with being watered, you pour that solution over the, the plant and that is your fertilization. You don't uh, want to dilute that. Pivot. Right, you right. Well, it's, yeah. it's yeah. You, you go by what's on, <coughs> excuse me. If you do the orchid fertilizer, you do it by what's on the label. Mm -hmm. If you do the, the big box store, the Peters, the miracle Pro, or whatever you're going to use, you want to use half the strength because fertilizers are salts. And, you know, think what happens when you put too much salt on the stink. You end up you know, not having a good stink. Um, Again, if you get the orchid fertilizer, it is preferable, but not necessary. And uh, just if it's if the package says one teaspoon per gallon of the big box store stuff, you wouldn't use a half of a teaspoon. So that's how you fertilize. And we talked about watering. Uh, potting mixes. Now, Bellinopsis do not want to grow in potting soil. They're what we call epiphytes. They grow on the sides of trees in nature. So their roots are always exposed to the air, though it's constantly raining, constantly humid. We uh, acclimate them to pots. Um, again, your potting mix will depend on what orchid you have. Mm -hmm. With a Phalaenopsis, wanting it to be evenly moist, uh, you're gonna have a specific type of mix for them. And we, we can uh, talk about that during questions. Um, now, your mixes are going to include bark, charcoal, cork, perlite, sphagnum moss. Uh, and you can buy them variously from orchid specialists. Or there is a brand if you do uh, big box stores. Um, I don't want to plug, but I'm going to plug because it's the best that I found over the counter type stuff. It's called Better Grow. And again, I don't want to plug, but again, I'm going to plug. It's only found at Lowe's and it is the best over-the-counter stuff that I've found. Um, I'm going to skip through the charcoal perlite and the sphagnum moss uh, until uh, maybe cover that during um, questions. Uh, when you get your mix, you take the amount that you think you're going to need, pre-soak it, literally overnight, hot water, let it soak overnight. Um, there's going to be little chunks of like little pieces of wood and, and what I call fakaka, stuff that you're going to throw out. You want to pick <laughs> that out of there and get rid of it. Um, I'm not going to talk about the moss here because that's a, a little bit trickier. Uh, before you take the plant out of a pot, you want to soak it real, really well, warm water, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever. Uh, what it does is it keeps the roots from, it, it keeps them uh, pliable. It hydrates them. Uh, pull the plant out of the pot. Sometimes you're going to get roots that are going to come down through the bottom of the pot, and you're just going to have to sacrifice some of those. Pull the plant out. Get as much of that mix off as possible. Rinse the roots with clean water. Uh, remove any of the dead or damaged roots. Roots that are papery or brown need to go. Anything that is what we call turgid, which is a good substance, thick, chunky, uh, like me. Um, Hardy. Hardy. We'll, we'll go with hardy, hardy. as opposed to chunky. <laughs> but um, you want to remove as many of the dead ones. Anything that's still good, you want to keep. If they're incredibly long, cut them back. Um, I would, if you're <coughs> cutting things between plants, sterilize between. There are diseases and stuff. It's sort of like my poor cough here, which is from dry throat. You know, coughing all over poor Bevan over here. Um, I would. You can uh, compost, but do not reuse the mixes. Um, when you're repotting, 
your path or your phalaenopsis, your pathophyllums or your phragmopediums, which are your lady slippers, you want to gently put that mix down around in the roots. You don't want to just smash it down in like you're doing potting soil because that'll crush the roots. Other orchids have enough of a root system that you can pretty much go whole hog and just smash them down into the pot. But for the most part, phalaenopsis, you want to maintain as many roots uh, as possible. And that was fast, but that is the end of the presentation. I went through that a little faster than I normally would, and I apologize. Um, any questions about Evans, uh, which is probably the more important thing to talk about, or the orchids? Um, Tim, I've got one just to, to kind of get us started off. So um, the phalaenopsis or the moth orchids that we were talking about, um, one of the things I see people do a lot is that um, they either over or they under water. So do you have any good tricks? I know there's the one with the, the, the chopstick things, right. things of that nature. Um, if, well, first thing, if you're, the leaves on your, I should have brought that up plan in, darn it. Um, if the leaves on your phalaenopsis are limp and wrinkly, it's not getting enough water. And then sadly, there's two reasons for that. There is one, it's not getting enough water, or sadly, there's the other end that you've overwatered and what you've done is killed the roots. Mm -hmm. So um, your best bet is uh, know your plant. Uh, there was, there's the pencil method or the, or the chopstick mm -hmm. method that you literally take a pencil or a chopstick, put it in the pot, and if it comes out, it still you know, looks wet that's a good indicator that it's still wet enough. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the plants now have clear pots where you can actually see the roots along the side. Ooh, and let's and see. I'll, we, I'll be seen? Vanna White. Oh, there, there we go. This is better. Yeah. But if you see these roots, see how they're, okay, uh, okay, over here. They're green. Mm -hmm. um, that is a moist, uh, happy root. Now, if you look at the root up here, how it's silvery and grayish, that is a non-moist root. So these roots down, this is properly watered. If you see the clear, clear pots and you see all these roots on the side are white or even that silverish color, it needs water. Mm -hmm. And these clear pots are absolutely fantastic. But when you get into some of these, you know, the next step up for a pot up from that is this one. And I tend to just use these uh, green nursery pots. Again, it's a little harder. Um, you take a chopstick or a stick and you put it in there. Uh, and if it comes out moist or wet, then that's fine. Uh, the other thing is sometimes you can go by the weight of the pot. When you water it, you kind of keep a you know, mental, uh, unless you have migraine, um, you keep a mental note of how much it weighs coming out. And um, Pretty much for plants in the pots that you see, the nursery pots that you're going to buy in the big box stores or this five or six inch pot, excuse me again, mm -hmm. um, are probably going to need, they're going to need water about once a week. So sometimes it's easier just to have a schedule of once a week as opposed to cutting around with things. But the, the chopstick thing and the, or the pencil is easy to do. Um, one of the other things I hear people say a lot, and that I, I experienced in the past, in the past, until I, I, um, I got a little bit more knowledge, is you get an orchid, it's got these beautiful flowers, and it never flowers again. So I know in one of your earlier slides you mentioned that light could be a concern. Right. Um, any other thoughts about that, and kind of helping people to understand when they should kind of trim right. back those those spikes versus when they should let them go. Okay, now I brought the same plant. Now, this is an old spike. If it's brown like this in paper or, or you know, uh, brittle, you just take it down. And I just keep this as a, as a display plant. Mm -hmm. Now, the next spike, flower spike, should be coming up in the next leaf up here. Um, if the, I'll show you this one too here. If this inflorescence, and I broke the tip of this off, but the inflorescence here is green and still mm -hmm. turgid, that's still fine. Now, I broke the tip of this off, which isn't a terrible thing, because if you can see right there is what we call a node, mm -hmm. right behind my finger there, that could potentially throw what we call a branch, uh, and it could be a secondary uh, flowering. Um, 
light. If you have a plant that is very healthy with these beautifully turgid leaves, you can see they're 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 not limp. Mm -hmm. um, now this one got this, sometimes they contort uh, in various ways. If they're turgid and beautiful like this, and they're not flowering, put it in more light. 90% um, of the time, it's going to be a light issue as opposed to something like it's hungry or um, something else. It, it has a lot of roots and it's a very healthy plant. Put it in more light. Uh, and that's probably your best bet. Um, most of the big box store orchids that you get are mass produced. So they're already good flowers. They know that they do well in the home and whatnot. Uh, so it's probably a light issue. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, one of the other things that I really love about orchids is how long those blooms can last. Um, I got a beautiful moth orchid, a Phalaenopsis, it's actually one of those ones I was talking about with the three plants, you know, mm -hmm. put into one. Um, I got it in March. It still has flowers on it yeah. and it put out more. Um, they like, they don't like to be moved a lot. <laughs> so yeah. adjusting for seasons and adjusting for lights is important. Yeah. But once you find something that works, That's, let them do their thing. It's like I said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or if it's not broken. It. Yeah. If they, yeah, broken. let's use proper that English. Works. That works. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Um, one of the things that I uh, think is really interesting that I'm, I'm thinking about now is what hobbies or what things do I enjoy that can really carry me throughout life? Um, I have a friend that recently um, got me into sailing over the last oh, few years. Neat. I need to take lessons. Um, I am a person who I, there's endless hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, which can be a lot of fun, but that's something that can, you, know, you can travel, uh, you can take classes, mm -hmm. meet really interesting people. Um, Cross-country skiing is another one yep. that can be a lot of fun. Um, and in, you know, joining the Orchid Society, um, I, I always love plants. Um, the Orchid Room at mm -hmm. Phipps is my favorite. It was one of my favorite places in the world. It's definitely my favorite room at Phipps. And the Orchid Society has a wonderful lady slipper collection. So if you've heard us talking about paths and frags and lady slippers and have no idea what we're talking about, go to Phipps. Yep. Um, you'll see a, a beautiful, you know, well-marked collection yep. there. Um, so the orchids, you know, that's another really interesting one. There's classes, there's groups. Uh, the orchid show is yep. really interesting and it's people that just think they're pretty and are, are yep. very much novices. Um, I'm probably on that end of the spectrum. Yep. Um, and then people that have, you know, collections of thousands, thousands. of orchids. Um, and it's really interesting. And you've got some people that have some on the windowsill. Yep. You know, we were talking earlier about someone that's, um, that, that's in the society who has their own greenhouse and irrigation system. Yep. So again, it's a spectrum. Um, but you know, think about when we're thinking about how much our budget is, are, you know, is this going to be a casual hobby? Is this something that's really going to influence a lot of your lifestyle? You yeah. know, there's members of the club that travel to, yeah. you know, go and work oh in heights. I work know. Heights yeah. To see some of the native orchids because orchids aren't just tropical. We do have mm -hmm. about 50 native species. Um, another good thing about the orchid shows or even the meetings are anybody who's into photography, you know, yeah. back in the day of film, photography was kind of expensive because you were constantly, you know, now in the day and age of digital, digital. you can yeah. go, so, you know, we have hundreds of orchid flowers and it's, we have a, some people that come in just with their tripods and, uh, you know, people are grumbling, but we're happy to see people come in and just photograph just for flowers. Phipps is wonderful for that too. Yeah. Um, some of the orchid hikes, uh, some opportunities there but photography hiking um you know all these various things you know as i you know covid basically the orchids and the plants got me through basically two years of you know of covid slash you know uh what do they call it? long haul covid which yeah. i'm dealing with and uh, you know it's, it's what we you know it's enrichment mm -hmm. it's doing you know you, you don't just want to live you want to have a rich life yeah and you want to have uh you know, these interests going into as you get older, you want to hold on to those because, uh, yeah, if it wasn't for the plants and stuff, I probably would have lost my, well, lost more of my mind. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, and it's, it's so exciting when you get that new spike that, yeah. that you grew. 
Um, so, you know, we talked a bit earlier about why hobbies are important. They make people feel productive. They make people feel connected. It's something introverts and extroverts can do. Um, and it is, it is really exciting and it's neat to talk about. Um, and, you know, just, just different ways to express interests yeah. and kind of span generations. Exactly. Exactly. Et cetera. I was, you know, talking about spanning generations. Um, I was talking earlier about some of the house plants that I have that literally uh, you know, I have a snake plant, which is a sense of area mm -hmm. and, and various other things that I, I come to the realization are third generation that I've literally had passed down for 60 years, probably more than 60 wow. years, uh, you know, various. And also, you know, the sad thing is now that I'm the last one who has them because I'm the only person who's really interested in maintaining mm -hmm. them and they're not necessarily even special plants. Just you know something that was my potentially my great grandmother's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really? Roses, exactly. Roses that were brought from the old country. You know that kind of Gosh. stuff. That you know, uh, again, crazy plant person. But. Yeah, little pieces of history. Um, you know, something we talked about too is is getting experts and outsourcing. Um, I have not been brave enough to repot my own orchids <laughs> yet. Um, that's something that I, you know, sort of rely on others to do. But even going to the show, you know, you can get ones that are um, uh, exotic and very unusual. You can get ones that people from the society have propagated. They've, yep. you know, split some off of their own. And that's helped me to venture out a bit more but without having the pressure of, I just spent $80 on this plan. Yeah. What if I kill it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the big box store, they, the fellow offices for the most part are, you know, our low end uh, entry level orchids. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm shamed, but at the same time, not ashamed of the fact that probably the most expensive orchid I spent when I was doing some breeding and really deeper into orchids than other plants um, was 500. And it was a very rare, very special orchid species. Uh, technically, it's the longest, largest flower in the world. It's literally the flower oh with the long petals is almost three feet long. Um, so you know you get a budget for that that kind of stuff too. You know if you want to branch out into different things, uh, orchid wise or any hobby wise. So, yeah. You know. Exactly. There's a there's a saying in the club: orchids can be hazardous for your wealth, but it, it's just planning and prioritizing um, and not beating yourself up. Exactly. That's really important. Um, if you're looking at this and you're thinking 10%, I mean, I can't put aside 10%. Um, or maybe you're looking at this and saying, I'm doing really well. I'm doing great. I'm proud of myself. I can give myself a, a pat on the back. Um, it's it's like planting a tree, right? Exactly. The, the best day to plant a tree was yesterday. The second best day is today. Yep. Um, so if you're looking at this and you're thinking, oh, I'm a bit behind, there's there's still time, you know, for, for most of us um, in order to make some of those changes or we can just adapt what our lifestyle is going to look like. Um, and same, if, if you're someone that's that's doing really well, um, maybe you're on the other side of it. Maybe you're worried about taxes. Maybe you're worried about legacy. Maybe you're, you know, trying to think of, um, of how to pass that along. So. You know, having experts in the field to talk to with, with whatever those concerns are and, and feeling like you have that support and community is really important for people. So, so you know, just like her, in our orchid society, we have various people that are experts on various groups of orchids. Mm -hmm. So we outsource to one of our members. Thank you, Tim. All right. So a bit about upcoming webinars. So charitable giving right on cue. Um, so we have one uh, coming up on November 28th at noon, and then smart tax tips. Um, I'm thinking about next year doing that pre-planning um, where where the, where the sun is going to be, both literate, yeah. literally and figuratively. Um, so we've got one of those coming up on December 7th. Um, also, if you go to our website under resources and webinars, there's a library of ones we've done in the past as well. So um, feel free to check those out. And lastly, thank you all so much. Um, check out the downloads. You're all going to get an email with a copy of the replay as well and some of those resources. Um, I hope to see your wonderful faces at uh, one of our upcoming chapter meetings. Or if you're not in Pittsburgh, you know, there's different societies all over the United States, just like we have clients mm -hmm. all over the U.S. 
Um, and I'd love to hear from you as well if anything here struck a chord and you'd feel like you know, you'd like a second opinion or just, just another set of eyes. And an expert gardener for yeah. your finances. And then our lovely disclosure slide as well. So um, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank Fantastic. you, Tim, thank for you being our, our expert, our orchid expert. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you Live so long much. And prosper. <laughs> Thank you.